For almost two decades, the LEGO Star Wars series has ah, 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 delighted countless tiny half-formed moron people, or children as most people call them to their faces, because they're cowards. For a lot of you watching, these games probably hold a very special place in some fond childhood memories, which is why this video is a, a risk. My fond childhood memories come from the originals, LEGO Star Wars 1 and 2. These games were later compiled into a, a, a fucking omnibus, I guess, and released under one title. Lego Star Wars The Complete Saga, one game that included the content from both previous games, with some minor changes. Use the Force in fun new ways. The change they showcased in the trailer was the ability to choke Jar Jar to death. Today I want to explore whether this game actually holds up and if it's worth revisiting as an adult for any reason besides nostalgia, and I invite you to join me as we discover whether the answer is yes or controversial. I just want to make that extra extra clear, the focus of this video is, is this game worth revisiting as an adult? As someone who's had a great time revisiting loads of my favourite childhood games, this is a question I'm interested in answering by really focusing in on the game's mechanics and how the player interacts with them. The game itself lets you play through all six Star Wars films. Each film is split into six levels, and each level can be played in three different game modes. The first is Story Mode, which restricts the player to playing through the level with a roster of set characters, usually the characters that were there for that bit of the film. Since different characters have different abilities, restricting the characters the player can use restricts the ways they can interact with the level. This forces you to take on the puzzles and the combat in the specific way the devs intended. The second game mode, called Free Play, completely lifts this restriction by allowing you to flip between characters mid-gameplay, granting you access to all the abilities in the game. This allows you to breeze through a lot of the puzzles a lot more easily, as well as giving you the choice to take on any of the combat in any way you like. This also allows you to access new, secret areas of the level that you weren't able to access with the restricted abilities of the characters you had in the story mode. I thought I was further back from the camera. These areas will generally contain some of the game's many collectibles, more on those later. The third and final mode, challenge mode, which was actually entirely new to me, is similar to free play in that you can use whatever characters you like, but there are 10 blue canisters hidden around the level and you have to collect them all within a time limit to win. The gameplay itself in all of these modes is composed of three main elements. Combat, puzzles, and searching for collectibles. Let's start with the combat, shall we? Even bearing in mind the fact that this is a game marketed primarily towards children, Fun new way. the combat seems built from the ground up to be extremely easy. The game essentially has a do combat button, which in most situations you can just spam to win. Melee characters, for example, have the ability to both block incoming attacks and strike with their weapon. You can do both of these things by pushing the same button. If you're about to be hit with something, the button makes you block, and if you're not, it makes you attack. You also don't actually have to block to deflect, you also just deflect during your attack animations anyway. Ranged characters work in pretty much the same way, but instead of automatically blocking, they automatically dodge. All of the characters will auto-aim to try and hit an enemy, so in combat encounters like these, which is most of them, you really don't have to do anything yourself at all. The game will present you with some enemies and then you can just press the combat button until they're all dead. Also, speaking of the auto-aim, occasionally you'll auto-aim on your allies, so um, that's not amazing. I'm not sure why the game ever assumes that, yeah, you just probably want to punch your friend in the face here, that's what you're trying to do. Now, spamming the combat button may work in the majority of the game's combat encounters, but there is one major exception to this, and that's when you're taking on melee enemies. Just just like the playable melee characters, they have the ability to block incoming attacks, so if you just mindlessly splam, splam, spam the combat button, then they will just block all of your attacks. Easily. So, that strategy's not gonna work with these guys. Instead, you're gonna wanna mindlessly spam the ground pound attack. Yeah, so all of the melee characters, except a few of the optional extra ones that you don't actually have to play as at any point in the game if you don't want to, have a ground pound AoE attack. Not only is it incredibly effective at clearing out enemies, it also counts as blocking for the entire duration of its animation. You can clear out large groups of enemies and they can't hit you while you're doing it. Enemies can technically hit you during the jump as you build up towards this attack, which might make you think this is a risk reward mechanic that tests the player's skill. However, this doesn't happen very often, and when it does happen, there's basically no way as the player you could have prevented it. The only way enemies will hit you during this situation is if they're aiming up because they fired when you were already mid-jump. If that enemy is at close range, then they'll hit you before you've even had a chance to deploy your attack. The ground pound obviously only works at close range, so there's no strategy that you as the player can employ to prevent these hits from going through other than just not using the ground pound against ranged enemies. So how does this attack work 
work against melee enemies. AI melee characters may be able to block, but that block is in no way effective in any way against the ground pound move. As a result, players will quickly learn that whenever they're faced with a melee character, all they need to do is spam this move and they'll win. But hey, if blocking isn't actually effective against this attack, then what happens when the AI uses it against you? Surely you'd have to jump out of the way to dodge it, therefore requiring the player to actually react to the enemy's attacks instead of just spamming the same moves over and over again. And that probably would be the case if they ever used this move against you, but they just sort of don't. The combat in this game has basically nothing to it other than seeing some enemies and spamming the attack button or the ground pound in response. If you've played LEGO Star Wars, be honest, that is how you played it. Now I feel it's important to note that none of this means it's impossible to fail. I'll always find a way and you can't stop me. After scouring my footage of LEGO Star Wars for a long time, I found there were generally three main reasons I would end up taking damage during an average combat encounter. The first was just getting shot as I was working my way towards a ground pound. The second was if while playing as a ranged character an enemy shot me from close range while I was already performing the previous animation, preventing me from dodging until that animation has finished, forcing me to take damage. This could mean they shot me as I was already shooting, or they shot me towards the end of a dodge animation I'd already initiated. This isn't something that happens at mid or long range due to the projectile travel time, so this is something you can try to avoid by avoiding close range encounters as a ranged character. While playing as a ranged character, that is the most interactive part of the combat system. The game also just forces you into this situation sometimes and then there's nothing you can do to avoid taking damage. For me as an adult, the system is far too simplistic to be engaging and as for kids, well I wonder how many of them even realize that keeping your distance is a valuable strategy to employ. I mean, I never did. The final reason I took damage is I just wasn't spamming the combat button fast enough. If you choose the wrong moment to give your combat finger a rest, you will take damage. Sometimes though you actually will take enough damage to die, so let's talk about what actually happens when you fail. On the occasions that you die, you'll drop some of your in-game currency, which is called studs, then you'll respawn and, um, pick it back up. Okay, so maybe you won't always be able to get all of it, but still, like, yeah, that's not a big penalty, is it? It doesn't meaningfully impede you in your ability to progress through the level. This is only something you need to care about if you're interested in the game's collectibles, which is another one of those handy topics we're saving for later. I would understand this decision if it was made to make the game accessible to kids, but considering the combat system it's built on top of, that seems entirely unnecessary. You don't need to do this to make the game accessible to kids. As a kid, my favorite games, aside from LEGO Star Wars, were Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, and Star Wars Battlefront. Just to name a few. These games were all easy enough that they were accessible to me at that age, but they didn't achieve that by just removing aspects of the challenge. If you're old enough to pick up a controller and understand how to move, jump, and attack, then you'd be old enough to at least engage with a more interactive combat system. This combat isn't an easy challenge, it's simply the absence of a challenge. This doesn't just make the game accessible to children, but to games journalists as well. For contrast, let's take a look at a level that actually challenges the player in a way that's unfortunately pretty rare for this game. The level where you play through Anakin and Obi-Wan's duel on Mustafar challenges the player not through its combat, but through its platforming. First and foremost, the platforming is pretty easy, but you can't just beat it by spamming one button. You don't get auto jumps to the next platform you want to go to, instead you have to engage with the game's tight movement controls. You judge for yourself the correct direction of your jump, and the timing, and whether it's a single or a double jump, and if you get it wrong, you burn to death. Combine that with the fact that to really, truly, capture the spirit of the film, the base you're in is being consumed by lava and the environment decays as you platform through it. If you die, the game can't just plop you back exactly where you were, no harm done, because if the entire room you are in is just lava now, that's not helpful. As a result, this level is forced, against its will, to implement a checkpoint system. The checkpoints are very generous and very frequent, ensuring that the level isn't too hard for children, but dying is actually a setback to your progression now. If you die, you have to try that bit of the level again. The result is a perfectly accessible platforming challenge that the player actually has to engage with. Then it ends with a boss fight. Um, here's a clip of me beating it with my eyes closed. What's happening? That was the first try, by the way. There are combat mechanics in this game that I like. When playing as a melee character against a ranged character, you can actually deflect blaster bolts and return them to sender. Now, I spent literally my entire career playing this game thinking that that just happens sometimes at random, but it actually only happens if you block when the blaster bolt is about to hit you. This is a great risk reward mechanic, forcing the player to risk getting hit in order to more effectively deal with an enemy if they're successful. And this isn't just one of those things that you can do if you feel like it, but doesn't 
really matter? You will sometimes find yourself in situations where you're a melee character and the enemies are some distance from you, making this the most effective way to deal with them. Mm. The only problem I have with this mechanic is that the game literally never tells you that this is how it works. It took me from 2006 until fucking yesterday to find out that this is a feature of the game. If you're a person who noticed for yourself that you only return to sender if the blaster bolt hits you shortly after you block, then I'm very happy for you. The fact that the game never at any point teaches the player that this is how it works feels like an oversight. It's not even featured in the hints menu, and that menu feels the need to explain stuff like the more money you have, the more things you can buy. I'm also a big fan of the lethal force abilities that some characters have access to, like force lightning, force choke, and force dangle a character by their foot until they're dead. These abilities are incredibly effective single target removal, since they can't be blocked, they completely immobilize their targets, and they insta-kill all basic enemies, including ones that have extra health. The drawback though is that this move takes a little while and leaves you completely wide open as you do it. It's up to the player to judge whether the situation they're in is safe enough to use this ability, and if they judge wrong, Wrong, they take damage. Although if you're gonna give the player this ability even in story mode, maybe don't design the level so that all of the combat encounters are melee enemies that attack you one at a time, because then uh, this will happen. So, that's the combat, but uh, what about the puzzles? They are usually the only other thing that stands between you and completing a LEGO Star Wars level. So, considering the combat, there's a lot riding on them to actually provide something for the player to sink their teeth into. Let's see how they do. Even bearing in mind the fact that this is a game marketed primarily towards children, the puzzles seem ground from the build-up to be extremely easy. Oh no. For an example, let's take a look at some of the puzzles in the Dagobah level. Mm. This little bit of swamp is a pretty typical area for the player to get through in this game. First it throws a couple of enemies at you, and once you've defeated them, you're left in an empty room trying to figure out how to get to the next room. At this point in the level, in story mode, the characters that you have access to are R2-D2 and Luke. R2, being an astromech, has the ability to fly for short distances, and the ability to activate special control panels. Luke, on the other hand, at this point in the story, has a blaster. This allows him to, well, shoot stuff, but it also allows him to use a grappling hook in any place that you see this special a little icon on the ground. So let's scout out the area and find everything we can interact with. Okay, well it looks like over here we've got the actual exit to the room. These bushes blocking this pathway can be destroyed by Luke with his blaster. But we can't get Luke over here right now because he can't get through the swamp water. We've also got one of those panels that R2 can activate. The island next to it doesn't really have anything interesting, just a few bushes that Luke can destroy and that's it. The first island that Luke is stuck on seems to be the same, just a few bushes. Okay, first things first, let's activate that R2 control panel to see what it does. Well, that panel raises a bridge over the swamp water, so it looks like all we need to do now is get Luke over to the second island and we can progress. There's now nothing left we can interact with as R2-D2, so let's switch back to being Luke. Okay, so literally the only thing here Luke can interact with is these destructible bushes, so let's just destroy them, I guess. Destroying this bush reveals a platform we can grapple on, so now we can get to the other island, we can cross the bridge, and we can destroy the bushes to get into the next room. Turns out, the solution to the puzzle was interact with all of the interactable items to win. You can do it in any order, there are no wrong answers. There are no other possible ways to interact with this environment. There's nothing here to figure out. If this qualifies as a puzzle, then there being some food on the other side of the room that you want to eat also qualifies as a puzzle, because you have to figure out that you need to walk over to it, pick it up, and put it in your mouth, and chew and swallow. If we go to the next room, it looks like there's some bricks we can build something out of, and they build a button, all right? That button summons another button, you can just go over and press, and that summons another button, and so on, and so on, and that's the entire puzzle. You just see a button, and go over to it, and press it. If for some reason you happen to die over the course of this puzzle, then don't worry, you spawn back exactly where you were. You don't have to engage with this level design in any way whatsoever to succeed. The rest of the level is made up of either combat or puzzles like these. Destroy the destructive flowers to reveal some wood to build a bridge. Push the button to push the next button to push the next button to push the next button. Fly over a gap to activate a panel to raise a bridge so that the other characters can cross. Platform through this cave except instead of checkpoints you just respawn where you were. Stack these boxes in the only way the game lets you to form a staircase. Use the force on these leaves to reveal some bricks to build a turny thing to raise a bridge. Push this clearly pushable object to the only place you can push it so it explodes into bricks so you can use those bricks to build a panel for R2 which you can then activate to finish the level. What you've just seen is all but one of the puzzles you need to complete in order to finish the Dagobah level. Why have I put one of them to one side? Well, we'll get to that. But first and foremost, let's focus on the fact that these are all just 
busy work. Something as simple as putting a key in a lock to open a door could be part of a puzzle, but generally this is made engaging for players by making the puzzle more complex so that there's stuff for them to figure out. Lego Star Wars on the other hand just puts 50 doors with 50 keys in a row. Similar to the combat, these puzzles are so simple that they're not just an easy challenge, they are the absence of a challenge. Each metaphorical door and key just has a different skin on it. Maybe just to fool you into thinking you're doing something more complex than seeing a thing that one character can interact with and picking that character. The puzzle from the Dagobah level that I put to one side is the only puzzle from that level that doesn't conform to this pattern. In this puzzle, you're presented with two red mushrooms that you can use the force to push lower into the ground. The shorter one you can push all the way into the ground, and the taller one you can push down to the original height of the shorter one. The mushrooms will only stay pushed down for a short amount of time until on their own they return to their original height. And at the same height as the tall mushroom, there's a panel that only R2-D2 can activate, making it clear that the objective of this puzzle is to get R2-D2 to to that panel. Now, I'm pretty sure the solution to this puzzle is pretty obvious to most people. Push down the short mushroom, then push down the tall mushroom, then switch to R2-D2, then stand on the short mushroom, then wait for it to rise, then fly to the tall mushroom, then wait for it to rise, then fly to the panel, activate the panel, and open the door. You probably worked it out as soon as I explained to you what the puzzle was. It is incredibly simple, but it is still more complex than all of the other puzzles in the level put together. Using the force on the mushrooms doesn't just turn them into a ramp or something that allows R2 to get to the panel. That version of the puzzle would only have one potential way the player could interact with it, making it just another key that you put in a door to unlock it. Everything in this puzzle though actually has to be done in the correct order to work properly. This is the kind of complexity that makes a puzzle a puzzle, it's, it's just not very much of it. Another puzzle with a solution slightly more interesting than interact with everything interactable to win comes at the start of the Great Pit of Carcoon level. All along the edge of Jabba's sail barge, there are these little panels that you can raise up using the force. When you do this, some of these panels will blow up and turn into studs, and some of them will just stay in a raised position for a couple of seconds. Part of the solution to this puzzle is to raise the leftmost panel and use it to platform to a higher area. I'm a big fan of this because it means the solution isn't immediately obvious, but instead is hidden within the set dressing of the level. In that Dagobah level we talked about, you might have to destroy loads of bushes just to find the right one, but once you do find it, a big red symbol appears, letting you know not only that you have found the solution, but also exactly how you have to interact with it to progress. These two puzzles I'm praising are ones where you actually have to notice the solution for yourself. It's a step in the right direction, but as they are, I find all of the puzzles in this game to be entirely monotonous now that I'm an adult. But what about when the puzzles interact with the combat? Normally, you can deal with the enemies and then start the puzzle, making the combat and the puzzles entirely separate activities, but that's not always the case. A few areas of the game where you're expected to solve puzzles also have infinitely spawning enemies. You'll clear out the room and then realize the party's only just getting started. Like when you've just finished consummating the newest addition to your harem, and then your butler arrives with 12 more women. This fundamentally changes how you interact with the game's enemies. Now they're just there a permanent fixture of the room that you're just gonna have to learn to grow to accept. The puzzle itself might be a simple task, or well, no, it's definitely a simple task, but now you have to do it while getting shot at. Assuming you care about the game's very minor death penalty, so you're actually invested in dodging the blaster bolts, this is a fun little challenge. That is, assuming all of the interactable objects in the puzzle can be interacted with quickly. Some actions, like using the force or building stuff, have animations that completely remove the player's control of where it is they're moving, and getting hit during this animation interrupts and can totally reset the task. If it's something that you can do quickly, then that's fine, because you can just wait for an opening and then perform the action. If it's something that takes a little longer though, you're just locked in place, hoping that the blaster bolts miss you for a while, which, you know, might be a tried and tested Star Wars strategy. But uh, for gameplay, I'm gonna say it doesn't work so well. Sections like this make for genuinely the most difficult puzzles and the most difficult combat in the whole game, and they're nothing but aggravating. There's almost nothing you can do to do better here. This game, that for the rest of the time seems committed to giving you the least challenging experience possible, will suddenly turn around and stab you with a bomb on a few just completely random occasions. The most challenging of these, I have distinct childhood memories of being the absolute fucking worst in the original games, but then when 
it came to putting the complete saga together, they decided to just put a power up here that makes you totally invulnerable, which enrages me because future generations should be forced to suffer as I suffered. It's nice that you don't have to suffer through this anymore, but the solution means that you just have another room that provides no kind of meaningful challenge to the player whatsoever. Unless they miss the power up or it despawns, then they're fucked. The rest of these sections though don't require you to do anything like that. These sections are on the same level as your average platforming section. The game's movement controls are tight and that's what sections like this really depend on. But like the platforming, you just respawn exactly where you were so the player has little reason to actually engage with the challenge itself. So far we've had some harsher words to say about this game than you probably expected going into this video. But while assessing the mechanics and the gameplay and arriving at the conclusion that basically all of the levels were bad, oh no, Fuck. There's something I couldn't help but notice that this game has refined to a fine art. As a retelling of the Star Wars saga in Lego, there's a certain atmosphere you might expect this game to have. And it's just so abundantly clear that a huge amount of time, attention, and care went into ensuring that this game has that atmosphere. This is one of the most charming fucking games I've ever played. Let's for example look at the level where you rescue Princess Leia from the Death Star. For one thing, there are a couple of parts of the level where enemies spawn from elevators. These could, and in most games probably would just be spawn points for enemies that the player can't interact with. But in LEGO Star Wars you can go up the elevators and find stuff like a dressing room full of hats that you can wear if you like. There is no gameplay reason for any of this to be here, it just is. Or you can find a pool full of stormtroopers all wearing bathing suits, but also all still wearing their helmets so you can tell they're stormtroopers. These are both just areas with a few extra studs in them for you to find, and they could have just been empty grey rooms. Everything about this game is presented in the most characterful way possible. If you don't disturb them, these battle droids just lounge around and play cards. In the cutscene where Obi-Wan says goodbye to Qui-Gon, in the background Maul's legs are still just there, standing there on their own. If you're playing as Lando and you try to punch Leia, because um, I don't know, I don't know why you're doing that. Instead, you get an animation where he kisses her hand. The game is quite frankly filled with unnecessarily charming animations. Gamorrean guards can play air guitar on their axes. Princess Leia can dance and wink at you. Man, that's fucking hot. Here's a clip of me beating it with my eyes closed. If you turn the music off in the menu, the cantina band just stands around without their instruments looking confused. Who came up with this? Stormtroopers don't have the ability to double jump, so of course if you try to double jump, nothing happens, right? No, that wouldn't be cute enough. Instead, you just fall on your face. And if you jump off something tall, you literally fall on your ass. It would have been so easy to just implement an animation for all of the actions that each character can take. But nah, this game doesn't just have a walking animation or a weapon drawing animation. Every character that it makes sense to has their own unique little cute animation for every action it's possible for them to do. Literally all of Han's animations are the animations of a man who fucks. This Lego figure has slept with at least one member of your family, and he was the one who didn't call them back. All of Lando's animations are just there to let you know that he fucks even harder than Han. He slept with two members of your family at the same time, and that's not even the main thing he remembers about that day. The bastard. I can't tell you about every charming little touch in this game without just describing the entire game to you because it is made of them. I can't in good conscience recommend that you actually pay attention to what you're doing in this game in terms of gameplay. I do however recommend paying full attention to literally everything else. Stuff like the fact that one of IG-88's melee animations is taking off his head and using it to hit people with. These games are incredibly fondly remembered by an entire generation, and that did not happen without a good reason. Every action you take and every room you go in, you have a strong chance of finding something new to smile about. That's not just something that happens by accident. You might have heard me say the phrase, basically all of the levels are bad, and come to the conclusion that I don't like this game very much, and you know what? I wouldn't blame you for that. But I adore this game. Ultimately, what you have here is a fully explorable, fully interactive recreation of the entire Star Wars saga. An incredible amount of effort has gone into allowing you to experience every chapter of the films in a whole new way. Or, in the case of Revenge of the Sith, in the original way. 
Hang on, what? So, little tidbit for you. The game we're currently reviewing, LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga, came out in 2007. It combined the content of two previous games, the first of which, LEGO Star Wars The Video Game, allowed you to play through all three Star Wars prequels, and came out in March of 2005, nearly two full months before Revenge of the Sith, the actual film. It still allows you, though, to play through a full LEGO adaptation of all the events of that film from beginning to end, meaning the first way that consumers experienced this story <laughs> was like this. <laughs> any dramatic moment from the film you can think of. Good, Anakin, good. <laughs> was, 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 was Lego first? This isn't an adaptation anymore, this is the original now. The fact the original game was developed while the third film it was adapting was still being made resulted in some other oddities too. A huge amount of content that ended up being totally cut from Revenge of the Sith can still be seen in LEGO Star Wars The Video Game and later made its way into LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga. You know the level where you play as Anakin and Obi-Wan and you have to rescue the Chancellor from General Grievous's ship? It might have occurred to you to wonder why for the second half of the level all the rooms are just on their side for some reason. It's okay if you never noticed. Well, originally Originally, there was supposed to be a long set piece here where the ship they were all in tilted on its side. The Ruin of the Jedi level includes a cinematic where Obi-Wan watches a hologram of Anakin killing Shaq T, another thing that feels totally random until you find out it's a deleted scene. In fact, that level's entire opening is based on another scene that never made it into the film. And I'm glad it didn't, because this scene is really dumb. Master Yoda, thank goodness you're safe. We've recaptured the temple, but we expect another clone attack at any moment. Mm. I'm sorry, mate. What's your plan there? Hi, Master Yoda. We're not clones. We're just a group of coincidentally identical Jedi. Identical not only to each other, but to all of the clones that you've fought alongside for several years now. You might think it's odd that we all look and sound exactly like them, but it's just one of them crazy coincidences, you know? Yeah, that'll convince him. So you recognize me then? You're wearing a different coat. You saw straight through that. Hey, Master Yoda. What is it, Master Windu? My pregnant- Hang on a second. You're not Master Windu. You you nearly got me, you little fucker. Did that really nearly get you? Shut the fuck up, Ben. You're a fucking moron, Yoda. Words cannot begin to describe how stupid you are. All right. But oddities aside, that scene was never any more finished than the state I just showed it to you in. The loving adaptation of Revenge of the Sith in this game is made all the more impressive knowing that it was adapted from unfinished scenes. They didn't have a final cut with finished effects to look at. For particularly CGI heavy scenes, which yeah, I think there might have been a couple of those, the team must have been working from these frankly brilliant placeholder animatics that showed what would happen when the effects were finished. They made a fully explorable version of this film based on material some of which must have been as unfinished as that. Okay, so they're rolling, they're rolling. Oh. Ripping bits off him, I guess. Nice push. Is that is that a brain in his chest? He looks pretty helpless there. Oh jeez! Oh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> But speaking of explorable, we've only just touched on just how explorable the levels actually are. It's time we talk about something LEGO Star Wars is famous for. It's collectibles and where they're hidden. This game is a collect- Ow. This game is a collectathon through and through, every level having 11 collectible items hidden somewhere within it, 10 mini kits and a red power brick. Each level is also filled to the brim with opportunities to get studs, the aforementioned in-game currency. And when I say filled to the brim, what I mean is that 
at some point during the game's development cycle, somebody asked the question, what should we actually reward the player with studs for? And the lead developer replied, <sighs> All you have to do is, um, anything, and you'll find yourself running around to collect all of the money that's suddenly everywhere. Which is an interesting decision from a game design perspective. Famously, a young child playing this game once asked, Is this really how the world works? Yes, son, it is, replied Hassan's dad. Studs don't just let you buy goodies in the shop, they're also a collectible of their own. Each level has its own true Jedi meter. Fill that meter up by getting to a set number of studs, and you'll achieve true Jedi and be awarded a golden brick. The more golden bricks you collect, the more of the game's bonus content you unlock, and collecting them all is necessary for 100%ing the game. You collect studs by, well, as I said, doing basically anything. Build something out of bricks, use the force on something, or destroy a destructible object, yeah, that's some money right there. There'll also be some studs just around for you to pick up on the level. Some of them will be in really easy and obvious places, some of them will require some minor platforming, and some of them will be slightly off the beaten track, although I'd still hesitate to call them hidden. Th these ones were just like, behind a door. I am a fan of all of these methods of distributing currency to the player, but with a but. I'm a big fan of every way the game gives you money for doing what you passively would be doing anyway. If you're rewarded with studs for doing something you need to do to finish a puzzle, or for picking them up as you walk across a room, then yeah, that's great. This is the game finding a secondary way to reward you for just progressing through the level. Alternatively, if you have to go out of your way to get studs, I'm on board with that too. The amount of studs the player is rewarded with should be increased to reflect the effort the player had to put in to get them, but that is normally the case, so I'm very happy with that. What I am less on board with is when a level will be full of a million tiny little interactable things, and interacting with each one of them individually gives you a very small amount of money. Take for example Secret Plans, the first level of episode 4. This here is a hallway, you're probably familiar with the concept, you walk down it to get to the other end, and I can do that to this hallway in 3 seconds. If you want to collect all of the studs in this hallway though, that's going to take you a full minute, because every section of wall can be interacted with in multiple ways, all of those ways giving you studs. Now I'd like to point out that this level is made up mostly of hallways, with the one major difference being most of the hallways are longer than this one. Getting all the studs on every level is going to be a fun challenge for lots of the levels, but there are still plenty of levels where achieving that goal is going to mean trudging through every area at a snail's pace, performing the same repetitive action over and over again. The only attribute of any player this is going to test is their patience. Getting through the first room of Ruin of the Jedi is something that I can do in about 30 seconds. You walk from one side of the room to the other, and you kill a few guys on your way. It's nothing that complicated. Getting through the same room while collecting all the studs takes takes eight minutes, and that's not eight minutes of gameplay, that's eight minutes of Also, since all of the individual interactable objects will be things that you need to either shoot or use the force on, the problem is exacerbated by the game's auto-aim. If the auto-aim prioritizes locking onto something like an enemy over an interactable object that you need to get money from, then yeah, that makes perfect sense. Enemies represent a much more immediate threat to the player, so it's sensible to default to them. Sometimes though, the auto-aim will just lock onto random stuff that you have no reason to ever shoot or use the force on at all, like your allies, for example. Here's a clip of me trying to shoot a bin that has some money in it. Shooting these womp rats doesn't benefit the player in any way whatsoever. I know that I'm not aiming my weapon directly at the garbage can here, but I'm not aiming it directly at the womp rats either. They're behind me. Surely it would make more sense to have the auto-aim prioritize things that there is actually a reason for the player to ever want to shoot. 
but at the very least when it's the thing the player is the closest to aiming at. This isn't going to fuck you up a huge amount, but when it does get in your way it can be kind of irritating. Collecting studs and this whole true Jedi system ties directly into the combat, since losing studs is the only meaningful way the game punishes you for dying. Like on this occasion, where I just walk into a fucking landmine because of how big and clever I am. Or on this occasion where I walked into a hole because I wanted to see what would happen. Most of the levels in the game have a finite number of studs, so if you die too many times and lose too many of them then you'll be forced to try the whole thing again if you want true Jedi. I'd say that of all the levels in the game, the one that it's most engaging to try and minimize your deaths through is the Anakin vs Obi-Wan fight, where the main challenge comes from the platforming which you have far more control over than any combat encounter. When you're platforming you can really focus to make sure you don't die, but when button mashing is the optimal strategy, it doesn't really matter how focused you are. Failure becomes a lot more arbitrary, and it makes sense to me that the more arbitrarily you can fail, the less severe the punishment should be. Fortunately though, with how the game is set up, this is exactly the case. When you die in combat, you lose more studs, but you then have a chance to get all of them back because they've probably fallen on the floor. Conversely, your platforming deaths happen because you fall into an area that kills you, like a swamp or a pool of lava or a big hole. All of the money you lost is now in that place, meaning you can't pick it back up and the punishment punishment is a lot more severe. This is absolutely perfect considering the nature of both challenges. The clear-cut challenge where all the variables are under your control has a clear-cut penalty. The challenge with fewer of the variables under the control of the player compensates for this by making the extent of the penalty a variable they can generally control. It's also a completely natural result of the money dropping at your feet rather than something that has to be imposed clunkily or artificially. Mechanically, it's not actually two different penalties for two different kinds of failure. It's the same kind of penalty both times, it just interacts with the environment in an appropriate way. This makes the system entirely intuitive for most players, and it isn't something that the game is ever going to have to explain to you. So does going for true Jedi actually make the level design engaging? Well, yeah it does when the challenge is platforming. The game's movement controls are tight, and the challenges themselves are well designed. My only criticism of the majority of the platforming in this game is that there's often no reason for the player to actually engage with it, and as soon as there is a reason, that criticism goes away. That is far from being my only criticism of the combat system though, so yeah, this is not enough to fix that. And unfortunately, combat is an element far more fundamental to the core of this game than the platforming is. The need to include a significant amount of combat in every level was apparently strong enough that chapters that in the films were relatively peaceful have had hordes of new enemies added for the player to fight. Like on Kamino, Django now has a personal army of droids that he sends to attack you and dislike bomb your videos. Conversely, the vast majority of levels contain minimal or no platforming. So studs and true Jedi are a positive addition to the game sometimes. On the occasions where they're implemented poorly though, they can turn the game into an absolute chore. But uh, what about the other collectibles in the game? It's time for us to talk about mini kits and power bricks. I've grouped these two together because in terms of the gameplay challenge they provide the player, they are the same thing. They'll be hidden around the level and you have to find them and pick them up. The difference between them is what you're rewarded with for finding them. If you find all 10 mini kits that are hidden within a level, then you're rewarded with a unique vehicle that you can use in the game's bonus content, as well as being given a golden brick. Each power brick you find unlocks a unique toggleable bonus in the shop. This can be anything from a total novelty item that turns all the game's money into poo to literal invincibility. Now, this is all bonus content. If a player gets stuck on one of the levels and can't figure out how to finish it, then they can't get to the levels that come after it. If the game was designed with the philosophy to be as easy as possible so that basically any kid can play it, which it kind of seems to be have done that happened, then in theory the optional extra content could be where the actual interesting challenges are provided without limiting anyone's access to the core game. Unfortunately though, it, it isn't. The obstacles between you and finding these collectibles are the same puzzles and combat that we have in the rest of the game. Typically they're hidden in side rooms that you can't access in the story mode and have to access using characters from free play. Once you're inside you'll be faced with a puzzle that as with most of the puzzles in the game the solution will just be interact with all the interactable objects to win. The interactable objects will be very clearly marked as interactable objects so you can't miss them. And then occasionally you'll have to deal with something like the mini kit is high up so switch to the character that can jump high. You might think that the challenge is to scour the level to figure out where all of them are hidden, but they make a noise.
It plays at the spawn location of every mini kit or power brick, it's directional so you can tell where it's coming from, and it gets louder the closer to it you get. As a result, figuring out where these guys are is really an engaging challenge, and then getting them is really an engaging challenge. You'll be walking down a hallway and you'll see a door that only stormtroopers can access and you'll hear the collectibles noise coming out of it. You'll go in the room and you'll find that there are some of the game's floor buttons for you to stand on. Then you'll stand on the lit up ones until all of them are green and then that's it, you solved the the puzzle? Congratulations, you did it. Here's the red power brick for this level. On your way out, try not to auto lock onto the wrong target and accidentally electrocute Jar Jar. Now, as I mentioned, this game oozes charm in every possible way. It is neat that you're setting up a cute little disco on Kamino, and it is absolutely fucking adorable that the Kaminoians have a cute little dance animation that they go and perform as soon as you finish. But in terms of gameplay, there is nothing to get out of this. There's a mini kit puzzle in the Jedi battle level that requires you to stack all of these things on top of each other to form a pillar. I forgot to record myself the first time I finished this puzzle, so it's a blue stud rather than a mini kit now, but you're a big boy and I'm sure you can learn to live with this compromise. The mini kit itself doesn't actually appear until after you finish the pillar, but the pillar is too tall for you to jump to the top of. The solution? Remove the top section of the pillar and jump from that to the top of the now shorter pillar and then jump up to get the mini kit. By making it so that the solution is to interact with one of the interactable objects more than once in different contexts, this is an actual puzzle. It's not a difficult one by any stretch of the imagination, but it is still a puzzle. Unlike most of the puzzles in the game, the solution isn't instantly broadcast to the player by virtue of them just seeing the components of it. Instead, they have to figure out for themselves the correct way to interact with it. Or at least they would if there wasn't a thing right there that you can use the force on to just instantly form a staircase. Yay, I almost thought I was gonna have to do something and like think and stuff. This game just hates having actual puzzles in it, even very easy ones. I think it's important for me to know at this point that I don't think these collectibles are a bad system in any way. It's just that I was looking for something a bit more than a way to facilitate more of the existing core gameplay we already had. On the admittedly rare occasions that the mini kits and power bricks facilitate more of the gameplay that I've already been positive about in this video, then I am very much on board with that. Most of the mini kits in the Anakin vs Obi-Wan fight mean more checkpoint based platforming, which makes me a very happy bunny. It's just a shame that the rest of the gameplay is stuff we're less positive about. Beyond that, there is one unique type of challenge provided to the player exclusively in the search for these collectibles. Now, these aren't very common, in fact there's only a small handful of them in the entire game, but it's still better to have some of them than it would be to have none of them. These puzzles require you to combine things in ways that aren't immediately obvious, but still make sense. Take for example this one in the carbon freezing chamber. The mini kit in this room can only be obtained if you grab a stormtrooper and drop them in the carbon freezing hole. Unlike most interactables, the hole doesn't come with some kind of clear indication that you're supposed to drop a stormtrooper into it. But you as the player in this room can hear the mini kit noise and know that there must be something you have to do to get that mini kit. If you're familiar with Empire Strikes Back, you know that this is the hole that people get put in. So, if you take a moment to think about it, this makes sense as something for you to try. I am a fan of the fact that the mini kits make a noise when that noise leads you to an interesting or charming puzzle. Unfortunately though, most of them are no more complex than follow the noise to find and pick up the thing. So, we've now covered what you're going to be getting up to in story mode and free play, but we haven't really talked about challenge mode all that much. While you're playing through the same levels, the mode itself is pretty separate from the rest of the game. In fact, none of the collectibles we just talked about even appear when you're playing challenge mode because the mode expects you to hyper-focus on its one set objective, collecting all 10 blue canisters within the time limit. This is a mode that didn't exist on the versions of the game that I played as a kid, so when I came to it for the first time as an adult, I thought maybe this would be exactly the thing the game needed. It doesn't matter how simple the core gameplay is because the challenge is now to do it quickly. I thought that that in itself might make the mundane tasks of the gameplay more interesting in the same way that the mundane task of driving somewhere is made more interesting in a racing game with the challenge of having to do it faster than your opponents. Well, there are two ways you can engage with challenge mode. The first is to just try and beat it. If you get all 10 canisters within the time limit, then well done. You have completed the challenge, my dude. Unfortunately, this time limit is so insanely lenient that it's just not a factor at all. As I got into the swing of playing challenge mode, I got pretty used to the fact that I didn't even have to make any attempt to go any faster than I usually would to end up with significantly more than half my time left on my first attempt. I don't just have insane amounts of time left when I go around collecting all 10 canisters, I have insane amounts of time left when I lazily meander through the level, spending a while pissing about in the wrong areas because I'm barely paying attention. Since learning how the game mode works, I've never even 
even come close to running out of time, which is the lose condition, and I really wasn't trying that hard. If you can play the level slowly and badly and still finish with more than half your time left, how is this ever going to be a challenge to anyone? I think the only people who are going to find the challenge mode challenging are people who can't find one of the canisters because they haven't realized that like the mini kits, they make a noise. The footage you're currently seeing is me beating a level on challenge mode, half-assing it on my first attempt. It took me just over six minutes. Engaging with the challenge mode in this way will just give you even more of the same core gameplay, with the one key difference being that now dying matters even less because you don't have any studs to drop. After my first half-assed attempt at this level, I then challenged myself to see how quickly I could actually do this, and in my second attempt, I got just over four minutes. In my third attempt, I forgot to get the first canister and didn't realize this until the end of the level because I'm so clever. So I had to backtrack from the end of the level all the way back to the start, and the run still ended up only taking me about five and a half minutes. After practicing the level for about 30 minutes, I was able to get it in under three, which was incredibly fun, holy shit. This is the second way to approach challenge mode. To just say, there's a timer, let's see how quickly I can do this. The player is incentivized to engage with challenge mode in this way, but not as well as they could be. When you finish a level in challenge mode, you're awarded more studs the quicker you complete it. The game doesn't record your high score though, which seems like a real missed opportunity. When the challenge is just to complete the level as fast as you can, suddenly it doesn't have to be balanced for kids, or for anyone. It's not a binary win or fail achievement. When the challenge is just to do something as well as you can do it, it's the ultimate form of adaptive difficulty. So recording the high score feels like it would be a no-brainer, but oh well. Trying to race through a level as quickly as you can completely recontextualizes a lot of the mechanics that I've previously described as unengaging. When you're playing the game normally, it really doesn't matter exactly how you spam your abilities. They'll all win you the encounter, so you're really not incentivized to think about it. But in challenge mode, is this really the fastest I could deal with these guys? No, I could clearly have performed better there. Now, in this encounter, we're playing a game of trying to score the perfect ground pound by landing exactly in the center of this group. Now for every aspect of this game that used to just be a way to get from A to B, there's a way to actually do it well and to do it badly. Oh, that was slow. There we go, we did that nice and fast. That was nice and fast as well. For me, performing as well as I can in the challenge mode means memorizing the canister placement so that I don't go anywhere I don't have to, figuring out which enemies I can just ignore and let shoot at me as I progress through the level and which ones I have to kill, killing the ones I have to kill as quickly as possible, switching between characters only at the most efficient times, and, you know, just trying to move as quickly as I can. I don't have to engage with the challenge in all of those ways if I don't want to, but I do because that's my personal skill level and I'm rewarded for it when I do well. If you're an adult and a gamer and you want to revisit LEGO Star Wars or indeed get into it for the first time, then trying to see how fast you can beat the challenge mode is my personal recommendation. Of all the game's main modes, this is the only one that I can genuinely describe as involving and engaging by virtue of its design. That is, at least when we're talking about the conventional levels. Occasionally, the LEGO games will give you a break from their conventional control schemes and deliver you a vehicle level. In its main campaign, LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga has eight vehicle levels, plus one level that has both on foot and vehicle sections, and on top of that there are a few more vehicle levels in the game's bonus content. For this section of the video, I want to look at vehicle sections that give you a fundamentally different set of movement controls to what we're used to. The game also does do things like let you pilot an ATST walker, or as I called it as a child, a chicken, which, you know, it's, I appreciate it, it's cool, you know, I'm, I'm flattered, it's just not what I'm interested in right now. I find that looking at the order the vehicle levels were released in tells an interesting interesting story of how the approach to designing them changed over time. The original 2005 game gave us three vehicle levels, each with its own unique control scheme and mechanics. LEGO Star Wars 2 then scrapped the more varied approach and settled on a consistent control scheme which was present for all four of its vehicle levels, even when it definitely shouldn't have been. The variety was moved from other vehicle level mechanics as well, as LEGO Star Wars 2 saw the introduction of a few consistent mechanics that were repeated throughout the vehicle levels. LEGO Star Wars the Complete Saga then retroactively added another vehicle level into Attack of the Clones, rounding out the number of levels for that movie to the conventional six rather than the five it had originally been released with. On top of that, the Complete Saga also replaces Gunship Cavalry, one of the more varied levels from the original game, with a new version that more closely resembles the more uniform levels from the second
second game. The original version is also included in the complete saga, but as unlockable bonus content. The modders for Podrace was also replaced with the new version, but the new version is really similar to the original, so I don't care. Let's start by taking a look at this more varied approach to the vehicle levels from the original game. The Moss Esper Pod Race level is, um, brilliant. Your pod is directed around the racetrack on rails, and you have the option to speed up or slow down, or move left and right. Your goal is to avoid hitting things that will slow you down, while trying to hit things that will speed you up or give you collectibles. If you lag too far behind, you lose and get taken back to the last check. Point. This gameplay is simple enough that basically anyone from your most advanced Minecraft 12 year old to your iguana could pick up a controller and give it a go. Since you're on rails, you don't have to do anything like the cornering yourself. You can dedicate your entire focus to trying to hit that green boosty pad and trying not to hit that rock. Just moving left and right relative to the things you do and don't want to hit is simple, but in this context it still requires a strong enough reaction time. If you do hit something though, it generally only slows you down a little bit, so you still have every chance to win. The Moss Asper pod race is lenient, but not so insanely lenient that it completely removes any aspect of challenge. This is one that you can't beat if you have your eyes closed, and you can believe me because I definitely tried. The track itself is incredibly varied, providing lots of different kinds of obstacles to navigate through. In fact, different events take place as you race, causing the track to change from lap to lap. Even though you're engaging with the same simple mechanics throughout the whole race, this kind of thing keeps it interesting. Most of the obstacles you deal with are big and obvious, but they come towards you very, very fast. The challenge is perfectly designed to be fun, fair, and to mimic how pod racing is portrayed in the film. This level is a perfect example of how to retain the lenience and simplicity that's required in making a game that's accessible to everyone, including fools and oafs, while still retaining the elements that make the gameplay engaging in the first place. Then we have the collectibles, which are introduced as an extension of the level's already excellent base mechanics. It's a really simple tried and tested system, they are scattered throughout the track and you have to hit them to pick them up. Not hitting the rocks is one thing, but if you actually want to get the collectibles, now you have to hit specific specific points on the track as you go. The level's challenge mode is implemented in the same way. The blue canisters are scattered throughout the track and if you want to actually hit them it takes some maneuvering more precise than what it takes to just finish the course. Trying to hit these targets at high speed can be incredibly engaging. The timer is still so insanely lenient that it will never come into play at all, but now there's a new aspect to the challenge. If you miss one of the canisters, you can't just go back and get it. You're on rails, you are forced to drive forwards, and if you finish the level without all 10 canisters, canisters, you fail the challenge. Because there are three laps though, you get three attempts at most of the canisters or collectibles, making this easier and more accessible without entirely removing the challenge. Every way the player is expected to engage with this level is an extension of the same base gameplay, and that base gameplay is very tight. With the first vehicle level in the game, we are off to an incredibly strong start. Now onto the original version of Gunship Cavalry, which I gather is actually quite controversial among the LEGO Star Wars community. It's another one of the game's only checkpoints point based levels, but this one has much more of a focus on combat. But it's not the combat mechanics we're used to. The camera scrolls consistently from left to right, but within that you can move in any direction you want. In your way there are various enemies and obstacles for you to kill or avoid. Uniquely, this level doesn't have any kind of auto aim, instead you just spam the area in front of you with gunfire. You're always forced to aim dead on in the direction you're progressing. As a result, where you're shooting is something that's entirely determined by your movement controls. The level is then designed appropriately for this with all of the enemies you might encounter appearing in front of you, and they deal damage to you if you get too close. Since you normally have a fair amount of time to try and shoot them, this seems like a completely reasonable condition to take damage. That being said, they do shoot pretty fast and can deal significant damage to you before you've even realized what's happening. Combining large numbers of this enemy with one of the most harsh death penalties in the entire game seems entirely inconsistent with the game's more lenient design philosophy. For that reason, I understand why this level has the reputation that it does, but aside from that, I think it's pretty well designed. The actual area you travel through is well conceived, and the enemies and hazards are pretty well placed. There are various rocks and chasms to restrict your movement as you go, which prevents you from just wiping everything out incredibly easily. But they're never so restrictive that they just force you to take damage with nothing you can do about it. We then also have these lasers, which will turn consistently off and on. When used on their own, they provide an incredibly fair test of the player's timing, and when used in conjunction with other enemies, they test the player's ability to focus on more than one thing at once. I also can't even begin 
begin to state how much of an effect this checkpoint system has here. When working with fluid responsive controls that take you through fair level design, this checkpoint system forces the player to actually engage with that design to do well. The level ends with a section where within a time limit you have to destroy all of these lasers and things at the base of a Techno Union ship to stop it from taking off. There is here a small aspect of trying not to get hit by the lasers, which is another fair test of the player's timing, but of this section an unfortunate amount is strafe and shoot and then that that's it, you won. Despite my criticisms though, I'm happy to call this a well-designed level. I understand why some people might not like it, and it is absolutely inconsistent with the rest of the game's design philosophy, but on its own, it's not a poorly designed piece of content. I would be very happy to see the majority of vehicle levels in the future taking on this control scheme, but that's not what happens. Since in the complete saga, this level is bonus content, there's no collectibles or challenge mode on it, so let's move straight on to the next vehicle level. Battle of a Coruscant is the final vehicle level that's lifted wholesale from the original game. It lets you play through an awesome sequence where you have to fly your way through an ongoing battle and board General Grievous' ship, which I'm sure will be just as cool when the actual film comes out and we get to see it for real. You play as Anakin and Obi-Wan in their Starfighters, or in free play you can play as Slave 1 and eclipse half the fucking screen if you want, but whoever you're playing as, the controls are deceptively similar to Gunship Cavalry. You're on rails, being forced to move through the environment on a set path, and on that path you have control over two dimensions of your movement. In this case, up, down, left, and right. It's up to you to use that movement to avoid enemies and obstacles, and to shoot enemies and objectives. The first thing you'll notice is that the path you're moved through is incredibly dynamic. You're taken on an incredibly effective tour of this battle scene, and you've got gameplay to engage with the whole way through. That gameplay is simple, but effective. Maneuver yourself in front of things you want to shoot, and shoot them before it's too late. Alternatively, if something's shooting at you, maneuver yourself out of the way of it so you don't get shot. Combine that with a set of checkpoints that are much more forgiving, and you have a level that's much more in keeping with this game's overall design philosophy. Although it's not so in keeping with this game's design philosophy that they took the challenge away. Speaking of challenge, challenge mode and the collectibles are executed much in the same way as they are in the Moss Esper pod race. They'll just be around and you gotta just drive into them. I would say that this challenge is a lot more engaging in the pod race. The passive movement speed in Battle Over Coruscant is much slower, plus there are far fewer physical obstacles that might get in your way that you'd have to work your way around to get the collectibles. As a result, picking up the collectibles on this map is a process of seeing them from a distance and then just moving slowly into them. The high speed maneuvering that made this engaging in the pod race is entirely absent here, and there's nothing else that makes it an engaging challenge. As a result, searching for collectibles or playing the challenge mode doesn't make for an experience that's in any way meaningfully distinct from just playing the level normally. It's a good level though, so uh, could be worse. These three levels are all pretty cool and all bring something unique to the table. The pod race is an excellent test of your high speed reaction time, just like it's portrayed to be in the films. Gunship Cavalry is a more complex challenge with more moving parts, but it lets you take it at a slower pace to compensate. Battle of a Coruscant is a midpoint between the two, but does have a few sections where it falls into the trap of combining the slow pace of Gunship Cavalry with the simplistic challenges of Mod Esper Pod Race, making it the least engaging of the three in my opinion. That's not to say it's a bad level though, because it easily makes up for this with just how dynamic your journey through the environment is. Right, now let's move on to the later vehicle levels. The consistent control scheme between all of these levels isn't a control scheme we've seen yet. You're not on rails of any kind and instead have full freedom over your movement, but only in two dimensions. In this respect, they're actually pretty similar to the conventional on-foot levels. They both give you a series of rooms or areas that you can move around in on a 2D plane. The main difference is that when on foot you can change direction as quickly as you like. You have as much control over the direction of your motion as you possibly can, because at any moment you can change from any direction to any other direction. In these vehicle levels though, your motion is comparatively restricted, as you actually have quite a wide turning circle. If you try to turn significantly more sharply than your turning circle allows, this locks you into an animation that flips you a set 180 degrees. This might not seem that significant at first, but this is the means by which you interact with the levels. The level of control you have over your character is significantly restricted, slower. This isn't an inherently bad control scheme by any measure, it just needs to be used in levels that are specifically designed to accommodate it. Uh, there is plenty of space within these levels that properly accommodates this control scheme, but at the same time there's plenty of space that doesn't. These controls also make tasks like picking up studs particularly finicky. The pickup distance for studs is actually pretty short for some godforsaken reason. So when you have this level of control over your character, getting them all can mean doing multiple passes over the same area in circles that you're now painfully aware are a bit too wide. Then if the studs have fallen near a wall, there are many many places where studs are intentional. 
intentionally dropped near walls. It's like 10 times worse, because if you want to pick up those studs, there's very little you can do to avoid clunkily bumping into that wall, which will deal damage to you. And if you die, you know where your studs are falling? Near the fucking wall. Since, similar to the on-foot levels, you now have free reign to go any direction you like on a 2D plane, the level design more closely resembles the levels you would be doing on foot. Each one is a series of rooms or areas, and each room or area contains a few enemies for you to kill and something that vaguely resembles a puzzle. And of course, the checkpoint system is now gone in favor of you just respawning where you were having dropped a few studs on the ground. There are still some major differences though. Starships don't have anywhere near as many ways to interact with their environments as minifigures do. When you're on foot, you can shoot stuff, pull levers, push buttons, push boxes, use the force in fun new ways, build stuff, and there's probably a couple of characters with you whose unique abilities you can use. The later vehicle levels though have much less variety to the kind of tasks you're expected to perform. The Death Star Trench Run level, for example, starts by introducing you to the game's torpedo mechanic. Torpedoes will be dispensed from various places, and you can pick them up and use them to destroy things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to destroy. They lock onto and home in on their targets, which is signified to the player with four purple arrows that point at the thing that they can destroy. The first room of the level has a red shield door blocking your path, and a thing that you can torpedo to disable it, allowing you access to the next room. There you'll find a red shield door blocking your path, with four things that you have to torpedo to disable it and progress to the next room. There you'll find a red shield door blocking your path with eight things you have to torpedo to disable it and get to the next room. There you'll find your path is blocked by a red shield door with eight things you have to destroy with torpedoes to disable it and get to the next room, and in that room the level ends. Having a thing in your way that you need to destroy by going and collecting some torpedoes and then shooting them at the thing is a staple mechanic of several more flying levels as well, and in all of those levels it is repeated multiple times. To compensate for this lack of variety in the puzzles, the game throws a lot more combat at you. In fact, I'd say it's fair to say that these mundane puzzles are basically just busy work to keep you in the room for longer so that you have to engage with more combat before you can finish the level. So, how is the combat in these levels? Well, it's mainly a matter of dodging enemy fire. You have no reason to not just be shooting constantly, and the auto-aim is pretty strong, so hitting enemies isn't really something you need to put any thought into. Plus, most of them will just respawn infinitely anyway, so hitting them doesn't even help you that much. No, the only thing that is productive to focus on is not getting shot. You do this either by manually moving out the way of gunfire, or by pressing space to perform an evasive maneuver, giving you a few invincibility frames. This is a great system, in theory, and performing a dodge at the right time when you see an attack coming can feel great. There's a couple of problems, though. I'm gonna play you a clip where I get shot at. I want you to tell me if you think there will be enough time between knowing the shot was coming and getting hit to react to it. The enemies aren't actually that good shots, and most of the shots fired at you will miss just because of the movement you're doing anyway. But of the shots that do end up hitting you, a lot of them will just come completely out of the blue, giving you virtually no time to react to them at all. I'm sure there are people whose reaction times are fast enough that they could have dodged these shots if they were really trying. But when stuff is constantly shooting in from off-screen, giving you just a fraction of a second to react, dodging it is disproportionately difficult when compared with the rest of the game to an insane degree. But you know what's generally not that difficult? Just picking your studs back up when you die. Players, therefore, aren't incentivized to actually engage with this challenge. You have infinitely respawning enemies that generally won't do anything worse to you than taking you out of the game for a couple of seconds. Every aspect of how this combat is set up incentivizes the player to basically just ignore it. I mean, you can hold down the shoot button and maybe move around a bit more than you would otherwise to try and avoid getting shot better, but that's basically the depth of your involvement. When the vehicle levels are that, combined with you doing the same exceedingly simple task, over and over and over again, they don't just lack engaging gameplay, they lack something far more fundamental to the appeal of LEGO Star Wars. They lack the charm. When you're playing a level on foot, the puzzles are cute. The animations are fun and varied. You're still seeing new ones 20, 30 hours into the game. And the secret rooms and Easter eggs aren't just there to give you a collectible. They're set dressing and world building and humor that really contribute to the tone. In the flying levels, you're playing as a completely unexpressive static model. All of the enemies and non-player characters are also completely unexpressive static models. The environments are much larger and they can't be interacted with on 
a human scale. Flying through an asteroid field or over Hoth or around the exterior of the Death Star simply doesn't lend itself to being cute and expressive in the same way. When you were playing on the inside of the Death Star, the secret rooms were stuff like the Stormtrooper swimming pool. When you're playing on the outside of the Death Star, the secret rooms are more of the same joyless grey walls that the whole thing is constructed from. Because honestly, what else would you put in there? This is how the collectibles are distributed in these flying levels, in much the same way they're distributed in the on-foot levels, only lacking the charm. These levels also feature what is easily the worst mini kit in the game. In Bounty Hunter Pursuit, the level that the complete saga added retrospectively into Attack of the Clones to round out the numbers, I found myself in an area where clear as day I could hear the collectibles noise. I couldn't for the life of me though figure out what it was I actually had to do to get the collectible until for a split second I saw the torpedo arrows appear on a little piece of Lego that was on one of the buildings. It turns out that there are five of these little towers in this area and that to get the mini kit you have to torpedo all of them, which while a little uninspired shouldn't be some kind of huge problem. However, getting the torpedoes to lock onto them at all is incredibly finicky. You can buzz around them for fucking ages and the purple arrows might appear for like a fraction of a second giving you nowhere near enough time to actually shoot. You can lock onto them for just long enough to assure you that yeah, technically it is possible to torpedo the objective. Hey, do you want to shoot this random thing half a mile away? I had to spend a full eight minutes in this section making random tiny movements near the things I wanted to shoot to appease a cruel trickster god who delights in my suffering. Also the skyboxes the wrong way up. Seeing all the later vehicle levels turn out this way is extra frustrating when one vehicle level that came out after the original game is really creative and really great. Speeder Showdown is the only level that feels like it's really carrying on the spirit of the vehicle levels from the first game. Of all of them, it bears the most resemblance to the Mod Esper Pod Race, the best one, and while I definitely wouldn't complain if we got another level that used all those same mechanics but just put us in a different environment around a different track, Speeder Showdown goes above and beyond and continues the previous tradition of making all of these levels unique. By combining on-foot sections with vehicle sections, it's already taken a step in a new direction, but even beyond that, the mechanics of the vehicle sections themselves are entirely unique to this level. You're not in a race anymore, you're in a gun battle on speeders, and everything about the design represents that appropriately. It's a real shame that this is the last we see of this innovative approach. Those are the vehicle levels though, and with that we've covered all of the mainline content in this game, but considering just how much of it there is, and just what an impact it makes, it would be amiss of me not to mention the bonus content. Basically every character from the films is unlockable to play as in Lego form. No, every character. You can do the Anakin vs Obi-Wan fight as Dexter Jexter if you want. For each red power brick there is a toggleable unlockable extra that does something fun and charming to the game. Plus a few more extra extras because why not? There's two player arcade, custom characters, two mini bonus levels for each movie, plus six more bonus levels that are unlockable by getting enough golden bricks, plus 20 bonus challenges where you play as bounty hunters. This game is bursting at the seams with just stuff that you can do in it. First things first, when you finish any given movie, you unlock three new challenges, Super Story and two mini bonus levels. Super Story is a time trial mode that requires you to complete all six levels of any given movie back to back as quickly as you can. This mode is good for basically all the same reasons that challenge mode is, while still providing a fundamentally different challenge by restricting you to the characters you have available in the story mode and by being a marathon instead of a sprint. This isn't just challenge mode again, it's definitely its own thing and it has a huge added benefit. It records your high score. This is another great challenge and I totally recommend this one to adults. Alternatively, if instead of liking fun you hate fun, you can play the same mode with the objective of getting as many studs as you can within one run, with no upper time limit on how long you're allowed to take. This tests the player's ability to painstakingly comb their way through the map, interacting with every little thing in every room on every level. I have never been more thankful that an objective is optional. Then we have each movie's two bonus levels, the character bonus and the mini kit bonus. These are all time trials too. For each of them, you're placed in a unique arena with infinitely respawning enemies and shit tons of ways to get studs, and required to get a million studs in under five minutes. You don't get to keep the studs. For the character bonus, you're doing this on foot. The arenas you play on are actually 
actually pretty varied, their layouts and unique features changing what the most effective way to approach the challenge might be. So even though there are six character bonus challenges in the game, it never gets pointlessly repetitive. This is also yet another example of the combat being fixed not by changing the combat mechanics, but by recontextualizing them. In the mainline levels, you can clear out basically any room of enemies by spamming the attack button, but here, your goal isn't to clear out the room of enemies. Here, you're trying to accomplish a task while they try to stop you. In this video, I've already praised some of the segments where instead of killing all the enemies, you're expected to just deal with the fact that they're there and dodge their fire using the game's tight movement controls. So as long as you're not expected to perform any tasks that are long and lock you in place, which in these challenges you're not, these segments are great. On top of that, these bonuses don't just use a system where enemies are instantly replaced if and when you kill them. Instead, enemies just constantly spawn in regardless of what you're doing. As a result of this and the fast-paced nature of the challenge, killing some enemies will be a useful thing to do to reduce the number of them that you have to deal with for the time being. You judge for yourself when you think they're worth killing and when they're not, and the best way to kill them if they are. Combine that with the fact that in this mode, enemies actually drop a few studs when you kill them, and they become an element that you can actually use strategically if you think on your feet. Combine that with the fact that this is a timed challenge, and now everything that I praise the challenge mode for in terms of its combat applies here as well. This challenge also makes the game's existing death penalty significant. You still drop a few studs and then take a couple of seconds to respawn in the same place, but now the challenge is to get studs and it is time sensitive. Both of those things matter now. The result of all of these things is an excellent interplay of several relatively simple challenges that you have to do all at the same time. Strategic thinking, platforming, combat, landing your ground pounds in the best place to hit the most possible targets, all of it comes into play here. And of course, to top it all off, in a neat little bow, the game records your high score. While I do think this challenge is excellent and engaging, I do have a couple of criticisms of it. For one thing, power-ups. Power-ups will sometimes spawn out of objects you destroy. When you pick them up, they'll give you a variety of status effects for a short duration of time. This includes, but isn't limited to, invincibility to all enemy attacks, a score times two multiplier on all of the studs you pick up, and a massive increase to the stud pickup distance. Making the game much easier like this for a short duration is fine in theory. It could even be used strategically by the player if they, for example, save a large amount of studs to pick up for when they have a power-up. The problem though has been on the screen for a while now. Power-ups drop pretty frequently and there's no meaningful upper limit on how many you can get. As a result, your high score and time to beat will almost certainly just be a run where you got lucky and strung a load of power-ups back to back, allowing you to just ignore huge aspects of the challenge and doubling your score as you do it. I'm very happy for luck to be a factor in the games I play, but I'm less happy about it when that luck can get so good that it allows you to just circumvent the game. Speaking of things that allow you to just circumvent huge aspects of the challenge, we also have overpowered extras and characters. Of the toggleable, unlockable extras that you get by finding a red power brick and then buying them in the shop, some of them have quite the impact on the gameplay. You know, stuff like invincibility. You also have four Force Ghosts unlockable as playable characters, which can do anything a normal Jedi can do, except they're also ignored by enemies and immune to damage. That means that the most effective way to engage with these bonus levels and get the absolute best time you can isn't to engage with the mechanics, it's to turn on a thing that lets you ignore them. Interestingly, in the game's other challenge modes, like, well, challenge mode, you're not allowed to use extras. Plus, for the race to a million studs bonus levels, you're not allowed to use stud multipliers, which makes sense because because that would ruin the challenge. Clearly there was an interest from the developers in not allowing players to totally circumvent the challenge like this. Honestly though, I'm not really a fan of disabling the extras as a solution to this problem either. Turning on all the extras and then just absolutely wrecking the fucking shop is fun in any mode and I want to be allowed to do it. In my humblest of opinions, the solution to any of these problems should be to allow the players to use all of this overpowered stuff, but let them know that their high score won't be counted if they do. The minikit bonus is basically the same thing as the character bonus, but it's a vehicle level instead of an on-foot level, with the same control scheme as the uniform vehicle levels from LEGO Star Wars 2 and onwards. Unfortunately, it does suffer from the same problems, like there being no upper limit,
limit on how many power-ups you can get back to back. Even more unfortunately, this type of vehicle combat is in no way saved by recontextualization. The optimal strategy here is still to just ignore all of the enemies while holding down the shoot button because most of the shots fired at you will miss and of the ones that hit, a lot of them will be completely unavoidable. These challenges are a lot less engaging as a result. What I really do appreciate though is the huge roster of unlockable playable characters. For every level that you have all 10 mini kits in, which for me is all of them because of how cool I am, you unlock a new ship, vehicle or droidica that you can use in these levels. That means a whopping 36 unique playable characters added in just for this bonus content. While very few of them are different enough to actually change how the player is going to interact with the combat system, they all have their own unique weapons and handling which is a huge amount of effort to go to for such a small part of the game. Even though I don't find the challenge engaging, I really do appreciate that this goes above and beyond. There are a few unlockable characters though that are so unique that they do change how you interact with the challenge. For example, if you want to be immediately shot to death without having the opportunity to do anything, you can play as a walker, if you want. Yeah, most of them are different because they're useless. Like the walkers which move so slowly that you can't actually pick up studs and most of the enemies do hit you now and that's it, there's no benefit to them. Or the sand crawler which combines the slow movement speed of the walkers with not having any weapons at all. I mean I still appreciate that they're here and they make a funny gimmick for a couple of seconds but I would appreciate it if we had a challenge that incorporates all the vehicles you can unlock. The one unlockable vehicle that actually does change how the game works is the star destroyer. It's much slower and less maneuverable than than all the other starships, but it's invulnerable and fires its weapon much faster. With its own benefits and drawbacks, it provides a unique playstyle that I'm sure loads of players will enjoy experimenting with. Moving on, there are of course six more full bonus levels and challenges that you can unlock with golden bricks. The first is the original version of the mod Esper Pod Race, which is shockingly very similar to the mod Esper Pod Race. Basically, it's just a lot less forgiving, the physics aren't as good, and a few other things have been shuffled around. If you like the mod Esper Pod Race, but found and it was a little too easy for you, you will absolutely love this. If you like the mod Esper Pod Race but found it was a little too hard for you, uh, get fucked! The second is Anakin's Flight, a vehicle level that lets you play through Anakin's assault on the Trade Federation control ship from Phantom Menace. It is, in every way, just another of the uniform vehicle levels, complete with the solution to every room being torpedo a thing to open a door. The third is the original version of Gunship Cavalry, the better version of the level. The fourth is an on-foot level called A New Hope, where you play as Vader assaulting the Tantiv Four at the beginning of, well, A New Hope. This was originally a bonus level from the 2005 game and that game only let you play through the Star Wars prequels. In that context, it made a lot more sense to have a bonus level that let you play through the first scene of the original trilogy, because then playing any scene from the original trilogy would feel unique and special. When it's placed in a game where you can play through the whole of the original trilogy whenever you want, this feels a lot more random. Still though, it's better to have it here than to not have it here. The fifth and sixth bonus levels are a pair of time trials called Lego City and New Town. Just like in the character bonus and the mini kit bonus, your goal is to collect a million studs as quickly as you can. The nature of the challenge though is completely different. There are no enemies or obstacles, instead you just need to go around a Lego City destroying things and interacting with things to get studs. While doing this as fast as you possibly can might seem like a perfectly good challenge in theory, there are a few problems with it. The first is that there is exactly the number of studs you need on the level. If just one of the little fuckers, of which there are a million, is hiding from you, you can't finish this one. So you would hope that they're not easy to miss, right? That what you need to do and where you need to go to get them all is very clearly signified to the player. The opposite of this is in fact true. In most levels of the game, what you can interact with is signified by the fact that it is made of Lego. Obviously, you can't destroy or use the force on every part of every map. For the levels to actually be playable, it's vital that the players understand what parts of the map they can actually interact with. In this room, for example, I can destroy part of the wall. Instead of having to just shoot every wall in every map to find that out, this wall is made out of Lego to show me that that's possible. Literally every part of the Lego city map is made of Lego. There is nothing to denote what you can and what you can't destroy. If someone had hidden a million needles in a very large haystack, you'd probably find the first 990,000 of them pretty easily. At the point you started, there'd probably have been more needle than haystack. But towards the end, did I, did I check in here? I did, okay, nothing in here. 
All right. Um, what's over here? Uh, did I try to destroy this building yet? Oh, no, there's, you can destroy a little bit at the end of this building. Okay, I've got a few more now. Is there anything else here I can destroy? Um, have I missed any more? Oh, th there was one hidden behind the wall there. Now, I don't think that walking through a Lego city and just interacting with and destroying everything that you can is that engaging to begin with. But when you're running around the whole place desperately trying to figure out what action you haven't tried on what thing yet, it can become so incredibly tedious. The last thing that I was missing, by the way, was that I hadn't thought to use bombs on these lights. Mostly because all of the objects in the game that you can use bombs on are a specific color to denote that you can use bombs on them. But these lights aren't... Yeah, fuck these ones. All of the other time trials in the game have a default time to beat baked into them. It's five minutes for the minikit bonuses and the character bonuses. It's 20 minutes for the challenge mode. If you don't meet that time, you fail the challenge and have to try again. For Lego City and Newtown, there just isn't one. They decided that an appropriate amount of time to give the player to accomplish this was forever. After you get a few more golden bricks, you'll unlock 20 bounty hunter missions. These missions are cute and all, but they really don't add anything into in terms of gameplay. You play as a squad of all six bounty hunters from the original trilogy and are on a mission to capture a specific Star Wars character. There aren't any new maps added for these missions and instead you're plopped down in an area of a level that you've already played through. There you have three minutes to just sort of look around until you find the person that you're looking for and then that's it. There are probably some enemies in your way but you don't have any studs and there's no true Jedi to gun for so dying literally doesn't matter in any way at all. Running out of time doesn't even matter because the areas you have to search are so small that you don't actually make any meaningful kind of progress. It's not as if you have to go back to the beginning of the level. You have to go back to the same small area you are already in and continue searching. The penalty for getting to the end of your three minutes is getting another three minutes. The characters that you have to find are never cleverly hidden or anything like that. They're just standing around somewhere and you have to check every room until you find them. Besides the novelty of having all six of these characters together bounty hunting, which is worth something, I do find these levels to be entirely pointless. It's disappointing because they definitely didn't have to be. I'm sure it's possible to make some kind of challenge on existing maps with these six that does have engaging gameplay. It's just not what we got. All right, what else have we got here? Oh, the extras, right, the toggleable extras. They do much more than just cause massive problems for some of the game's time trial modes, you know. Do you want literally every character in the game to be wearing a fake nose, mustache, and glasses? Well, that's an option you can unlock. Why? Because it's fucking charming. Did you think I was done praising this game for its charm? Because we're about to pile on a whole load more. A lot of the extras have minimal or no effect on the gameplay, but are just fucking cute. Like Super Gonk, which makes the Gonk droid one of the fastest and most nimble characters in the game. Do you want to play the Anakin Obi-Wan fight as the Gonk droid? There's Daisy Chains, which replaces all the grappling hooks with, you guessed it, Daisy Chains. There's self-destruct, silhouettes, extra toggle, oh my god, extra toggle. So what extra toggle does is it lets you switch into playing as loads of extra playable characters who are specific to certain levels. Most of them, while pretty useless, are fun and cute. You can be a skeleton, a buzz droid, a buzz droid but in space, one of the Jedi's balls, engineers who have a weapon drawing animation where they check the wrong pocket first, every droid from the Jawa Sandcrawler, they can kill, you can be a a womp rat. Look out for Han. A mouse droid. Deja vu. An at, at pilot. A scout trooper, which probably should just be an unlockable character, to be honest. The Rancor and the Womper. And to top it all off, you can just flop around as Han frozen in carbonite, which is as cute and charming as it is deeply disturbing. Then after that, you've got stuff like Darkseid, which makes the lightsaber of every friendly character red and gives them the ability to use Darkseid force powers, even if they're not a Darkseid user. The Super Ewok Catapult, which replaces all the rocks from Ewok 
walk slingshots with torpedoes. Something that's funny enough that I'll forgive it for not being the super fun Ewok firing device that it sounds like. None of this content actually needed to be added to the game. It doesn't do anything substantial to the gameplay, but it adds to what I think is the game's core appeal. It contributes to the wealth of absolutely adorable stuff you can find. There's not an avenue you can poke your nose down without finding something cute, except the then you've got the extras that are specifically there to modify the gameplay. Stuff like invincibility, fast force, fast build, stud multipliers. Each one of these is specifically designed to make an aspect of the game easier or more convenient. Unlock them all and turn them all on and you're a god. Here's what happens if you buy and stack every stud multiplier. First of all, I'm a massive fan of all the ones that are just small quality of life improvements. Stuff like fast force and fast build, which just make things that you do a lot a bit faster make perfect sense to me as something that you're rewarded with for finding the red power brick to unlock it and then buying it in the shop. This is just a natural form of progression by making the player slightly more powerful in a non-intrusive way. Stuff like super blasters, which lets you shoot enemies that would normally take two hits in one hit. Please ignore the fact that that just happened. I'm no less clumsy in real life. I recently injured myself by putting my glasses on too hard. I drew fucking blood. Then we have things that are a bit stronger, like invincibility. Well, they're generally priced appropriately so they're only available later on in the game. I do think that the pricing could do with being maybe even higher than it already is, but it's not absurdly low. And when it comes to endgame content in a single player experience, is there really such a thing as being overpowered? Unlocking these extras isn't the game presenting you with a new challenge, it's the game telling you you've finished the challenge now and get to just fuck around however you like. Maybe there should be some more limitations in place to make sure that the player doesn't get this too soon, but it's okay that it exists. And it is pretty entertaining spending a little while absolutely wrecking shop once you have them all. Once you finish all that sweet sweet bonus content and unlock all 160 golden bricks, you get one final reward. You can go outside in the hub world and build this a uh, thing. Build this thing to instantly unlock all extras in the game, and also it showers you with money. Now as rewards go, this is... Let me tell you what the reward is again, but this time I'll phrase it a bit differently. Build this thing to instantly not do anything because you've already bought everything in the shop, including all the extras. And I mean, getting showered in money feels good, I guess, but there's nothing left to spend it on. Getting this reward requires you to complete basically every challenge in the game. And it's impossible to do that without earning shit tons of studs. It's more than plausible that by the time the player gets to this point, they'll have earned more than enough studs to buy everything in the shop, so will have done. I personally had earned more than enough studs to buy everything in the shop dozens of times over. Please put your underwear back on. You know, I'm, I'm flattered, but you gotta stop doing this to me at work. Nothing tells the player what this reward is gonna be until they actually build it. You have always known that this is the very last reward in the game, and until now it's just been sitting there, inaccessible and mysterious. Literally every other thing in the game that you build out of gold bricks is a door that gives you access to a bonus level, so I think players are probably expecting something along those lines with this. All of the context implies there's going to be something unique and special here, and the player has had their entire playthrough, probably dozens of hours, to let their imagination run wild. They'll put in all the work to get all of the golden bricks, wondering what this reward is going to be, and then be given absolutely nothing when they get it. An experience which it could, unfortunately, be pretty disappointing for some players to end on. I think it's more than fair to call this game an extremely mixed bag, but also a classic. One thing that I absolutely wasn't expecting when I revisited this game was the absolute breadth and variety of content. It doesn't matter if you're an experienced gamer or if this is literally your first game and you're a five-year-old. I doubt that you find every way that you can play this game absolutely captivating, but I also doubt that you'd find literally none of the ways to play this game captivating. Currently, the game is sitting at £15 on Steam and I think it's well worth that price, especially if you happen to have an infinite money spitting machine and all of the stud multipliers. I think for me recommending this game to adults, the biggest drawback is that you have to play through a lot of the game modes that I've described as less engaging to unlock the ones that I've described positively. Even then though, you're not in for some totally tedious experience. 
I will happily say you're in for tedious gameplay, 100%, but there's a lot more to games than gameplay. In the process of making this video, I found... Hey everybody, this is Jeremy Denham, Editor-in-Chief of IGN PS2, and today we'll be taking a look at LEGO Star Wars. The IGN review of LEGO Star Wars the video game from 2011. It's not a very good video, and I, I might um, respond to it live at some point. My Twitch is in the description. But a couple of the points made stick out in my mind so much that I can't in good conscience upload this video without giving them a little bit of a look. Let's start by listening to Jeremy talk about Oh god, I'm doing a video response to someone called Jeremy. I've been thrust back into cinema since since. Let's listen to Jeremy talk about the puzzles in the game. There's also a, a greater emphasis on puzzles the longer you go into the games. A little bit later you start to really need to exploit the abilities of your characters. There are some stages that will actually require you to use up to six characters at a time. And that takes a lot of brain power. And that takes a lot of brain power. And that takes a lot of brain power. So. I'm here at one of the game's more complex puzzles. I'm not sure that there are any puzzles in the game that require the abilities of more characters than this one does. Although, I already have 460 hours in this game, so I'm not going to go through every level doing every puzzle counting the number of steps just to make sure there isn't one with a couple more. The main thing is, this is definitely an example of the thing he was just talking about. So to start off the puzzle, we're in a room with a thing that only dark side characters can use the force on, so... Hmm... What is the first step? Well, what we want to do is select a dark side force character and use the force on that thing. Okay, that's blown it up and revealed behind it a hatch. Hatches in this game can be used by any short character, so what we want to do here is select a short character and then use the hatch. Once I'm on the other side of the hatch, this automatically opens a grating, allowing my AI controlled partner to get through. But now, it looks like we're confronted with another head scratcher. There are two buttons on the ground that, when stepped on, activate. What will we do? I'm just gonna stand on the fucking button, eh? This has opened a grating to the right of us, and we find ourselves in a room where our path is blocked by lava. In this room, there is an object sparkling to indicate we can use the force on it, and no other objects we can interact with. By using my brain, I'm going to switch to a Jedi and use the force on that object. This has revealed an object that I can use the dark side of the force on. Hmm. What a quandary this is! You know what? I think you've probably got the point I'm making by now. And if you've not, why not try using some brain power? I just- I just don't get it. I don't get how anyone could ever describe this as being a puzzle that requires a lot of brain power. Like, you're just matching characters that can do a thing with the thing that they can do. This is no more complex than put the round shape through the round hole and the square shape through the square hole. It's really clever. The puzzles move quickly, but it, it actually makes you think, and that's a, a real big advantage. He also makes one other comment that I'm interested in covering. Questions that I get a lot from uh, from our readers and our email is, how much of the movie does this spoil? It actually doesn't spoil much of episode three at all. You know, except for every major character death, along with the details of how and when those deaths happen, uh, the ending, all that stuff is spoiled. But, you know, other than that, Seaman, when I made that co- Seaman, Seaman, when I made that comment earlier about them making the game accessible to games journalists, I wasn't joking. That was a very serious comment. If you laughed at it, please issue a, a formal apology to me in writing. But, uh, I, I think there's a reason I'm sat in front of the camera now, isn't there? Oh, you're yeah, right. Do you want to own me? Like, as property? Well, now you can. With the new JXE plush from Makeship. The link in the description. The JXE plush comes with a cute little rhino friend, detachable, and the uh, timestamp of the fall of Doctor Who emblazoned on the, the little jumper here. You can get them now for a limited time only. Get them while they're available. Link in the description. I, I didn't script this because I thought it would be funnier. Companies who were interested in paid deals with me, this is what you're getting. Uh, this is how I do them. As a bonus, if you buy one and then tweet me a picture of the one of them that you bought in like a funny pose or place or something, I will have a look at it live on my second channel. So don't miss out. Give money.